In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Jesus cried in a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I'd like to focus on three words out of that cry. And I give thanks to Timothy Keller, who spoke about this in one of his talks. First word is cry. Cry tells us what happened that day. Second word is why. It tells us the reason it happened. And the third word is my. This tells us what he accomplished through what happened. First is cry. Both Matthew and Mark report that at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Jesus cried out with a loud voice. By loud voice, the translators may be softening the original Greek to spare us readers. The original is closer to scream. And it turns out that even among the scholars and historians who distrust the Bible, think it more a product of ancient credulity and legend, even those harsh critics look at this passage and admit that Jesus must have made this cry. You see, to write an account in order to promote a religion and its founder, it would be crazy to cast the founder, in this case Jesus, in such a despondent, despairing light. Jesus here seems to have given up hope to give in to crushing and humiliating defeat as he cries. You get a religion off the ground by attracting followers, not repelling them right from the start. The only possible reason to admit this in a public record, note these critics say this, is that Jesus really did scream out those words. And there's more. The first readers of these Gospels knew both Greek and Aramaic. Think about it. There's no reason then to record his cry in Aramaic. Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani. In an otherwise Greek text, yet Matthew and Mark did. Why? Because this is eyewitness testimony. This really happened. His cry is a record of real history. But now to the why. Why was Jesus forsaken by God? If he was, then What's the difference between the God of the Bible and the bloodthirsty, pitiless gods of Greek and Roman mythology? King Ag Agamemnon leads Greek forces against Troy, and as they sail, they anger the goddess, goddess Artemis, who stalls their ships with ill winds. Artemis demands a sacrifice, and nothing less than Agamemnon's daughter will do. So now the cruel cross and just one more vengeful God who must be appeased by one more helpless victim, right? No. Look once again, not at a Greek myth, but at the real day in history, that Good Friday. The gospel writer's eyewitness accounts report that from noon until three, for three hours prior to Jesus' scream, there was darkness over the whole land. Those who knew the Old Testament knew that it was the supernatural darkness foretold by the prophets, God's judgment against the nations of earth, his settled opposition to human evil. This from the eighth chapter of the prophet Amos, quote, On that day, declares the Lord God, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. I will make it like the grieving for an only son. And at the end of it, it will be like a bitter day. At noon, darkness, like grieving for an only son. Written almost 800 years before Jesus' birth. And you know Jesus screamed out scripture? The opening verse of Psalm 22. It may be the most shocking psalm David ever wrote. He wrote many psalms. Some were to mark events. Some were terrible events in David's life. But David writes in Psalm 22, quote, 
All who see me mock me. I'm surrounded. I'm poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. Evildoers are encircled me. They pierce my hands and my feet. They divide my clothing among them and cast lots for them. Bible commentators tells us this refers not to some illness David had or the report of an assault. No, this is a public execution. When was David ever dragged out into the open and impaled while a crowd jeered and mocked and gambled for his clothes? Never. David saw under the influence of the Holy Spirit through to the day that one from his lineage, the true and greater king, Jesus, would be executed, and he saw it in shocking detail. The Old Testament in many ways pointed to this day we call Good Friday, the day when God's judgment on every human being, past, present, and future, came down like a crushing hammer, but not on us. It came down on Jesus. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, as revealed in Scripture, planned it this way. What? Hear this from John's Gospel, chapter 10. Quote, For this reason the Father loves me, said Jesus, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me. But I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. And this from Peter, preaching to the crowds in Jerusalem after the resurrection, Acts chapter 2. Quote, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders at signs and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Jesus agreed to be abandoned by his Father and killed by us on the cross. It was the greatest rescue mission ever carried out on earth. This is not a God demanding our blood. This is the true God of the universe in order to shield us from our deserving just wrath in the person of his only son bleeding and dying in our place, substituting his blood for ours. Now suppose we're progressives in our day and we seem allergic to the idea of an angry God who must be appeased. We much prefer the God of completely accepting love with no trace of anger. Please consider how terribly misleading and distorting this current preferred concept of God is. It shows that we don't understand how a heart works. You can't pit love and anger against each other. It's precisely God's immeasurable love that makes him angry at evil and wrong. This anger, this wrath is not cosmic crankiness. It's not an irrational outburst, but in Pastor Ray Ortland's words, quote, this is his morally appropriate, carefully considered, justly intense reaction to our evil that demeans his worth and destroys our own capacity to enjoy him, as well as destroying us. Several years ago, a woman wrote an essay in which she struggled with the understanding of God's wrath when she remembered a time when she witnessed two people she loved, who she admired, spiral down into drug abuse. This is what she wrote. Quote, I felt fury. Everything in me wanted to shake them. Can't you see, I said to them, don't you know what you're doing to yourself? You're becoming less and less yourself every time I see you. Don't you see what you're trying to do to this, not just you, but to other people around you? And then she wrote this down. Real love stands against the deception, the lie, the sin that destroys. Anger and love are inseparably bound and experienced. And if I, flawed, narcissistic woman that I am, can feel this much pain and anger over someone's condition out of love, how much more a morally perfect God who has made them? Anger isn't the opposite of love. Hate is, and the final form of hate is indifference. What we see ignited at Gethsemane, at his arrest, and blazing 
and his execution this Good Friday is not hateful indifference, but the full intensity of real love and just anger on display at the cross. Well, finally, we come to the word my. My. It tells us what he accomplished for us. My God, my God points to the covenant wherein God promised throughout Scripture that he has bound himself to those he loves in the most solemn and utmost way. Think for a moment. If you hear me mentioning something about, say, Sarah, you might guess that I at least know about this person. But if you hear me say, my Catherine, then you rightly assume that she's one of my own, that she belongs to me as family, and she's so closely tied to me that she calls me my dad. The Bible announces that God puts his love on his people so that they can say that he is my God, and they are his people. He desires that most intimate of bonds with each one of us, but we by nature do not desire him. We run, we hide from him, from others, even from ourselves. And what we see this Good Friday is Jesus on the cross screaming that though he is being willingly abandoned, taking the just sentence due every last one of us, he still loves and obeys. And instead of running, he stays. Do you really think that Roman spikes held him fast to the cross? No. The most stunning thing of all is that the Lord of the universe summoned and focused his divine power and strength to stay weak, to bleed out and to breathe out, to empty himself. On the cross, Jesus agreed to be abandoned and die so that you and I can be welcomed and live. Thus Paul can say that the cross shows Jesus' righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in him. For our sake, he made him who knew no sin to be sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. This Good Friday, sinner, and trust me, a sinner in desperate need of rescue is talking to you now. Sinner, hear these last words of Jesus himself. It is finished. It is accomplished. Victory over sin and death forever. All for you and for me. Worthy is this lamb this lion of the tribe of Judah who has conquered by being slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. The triumph of Good Friday is yours and mine through him. Amen.